So when people refer to a Semite, I need to be clear on the original terminology of this word. A Semite is referring to a person who speaks what we call a trilateral consonant language, like we've seen in Hebrew, where you get three consonants put together to make a word, and you add the vowel points. Semitic languages, which include, by the way, I think this is important for people to understand, include things like Arabic, Phoenician. There's a whole umbrella category that falls under this. <laughs> In your Bibles, if you want to open to Genesis 10, which is commonly referred to as the table of nations by most people who study the Bible, there is a list there in chapter 10. Now, these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So these are the sons of Noah, three of them. And unto them were born sons after the flood. Now, what's interesting is we have this first group of people being mentioned, Japheth, and then descendants, Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Mishik, Tiras, sons of Gomer, Ashkenaz, Rithba, Tugamar. And as I told you, I mentioned this just in passing. There are three distinct lines coming from Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, if you read carefully, the sons of Javan, and Javan we know refers to the Greek people, Elisha, Tarshish, Kittim, and Dodanim. Uh, by these were the isles of the Gentiles dividing their lands, every one after his tongue and after their families and nations. And then it goes on to the sons of Ham. And if you keep reading on, you get to the sons of, or the, it's the sons of Shem, unto Shem also the father of the children, verse 21, of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder, even unto him were children born, and it goes on to say who the children of Shem were and that line. Now, you'll have to forgive me. This is not the prettiest diagram, and maybe my staff will be kind to uh, try and make this into something that is a little bit more uh, pretty to look at. This is my chicken scratch. I really didn't do this to show publicly. but So this is only the line of Japheth here. I, as you can see, I've put Ham and Shem over here, but this is just the line of Japheth. And what I want to show you is if you take from Japheth, and you can see some of the descending line, you've got here Gomer, Ashkenaz, Riftha, Tagomar, and these people generally, especially Ashkenaz and this uh, Togarma, if you will, Armenians claim descent from these people right here. This, as I said, is the line of Japheth. The line of Shem which is the line that basically the Bible is concerned with, all right? We have to be kind of, God put this in to show the table of nations, but what God's concern is really going to be with, ultimately, is the line of Shem. This line, and you can see here, you've got the sons of Shem, Elam, which become the Elamites, Asher, which becomes the Assyrians, which include the North Iraqis, um, then you go down from this line here, Afek, Sad, Selah, Eber. The origin of the name Hebrew, Apiru, Abiru, comes from this name right here. Very clear, we can see that as we go down to this line here, which produces Abraham, Abraham indeed will be known as a Hebrew. But we cannot call Abraham a Jew because there was no such thing as such then. And we cannot call Abraham either an Israelite, as there was no such thing then, all right? So first terminology is that Abraham, we know from the Bible, it says he came out of Ur of Chaldees. And there's a big scientific and geological question now that has arisen as to the real place that he came out of. But assuming that it is the traditional place we've talked about, Ur of Chaldees, all right? Assuming that, most of you have a Bible map in your Bible. So at some point, check this out and look at where it is. Uh, but the interesting thing is to make sure we understand he came out of a land that would have been predominantly steeped in all kinds of different gods and worship. There was no such thing at this time as Jew or Israelite. Claro? OK, good. We're going to make progress then. Now, the next thing I want to show you is something else so that we're not confused the line 
that we are concerned with or that people would be concerned with, which is called the Shem line or the Semitic line, is one thing. But if we're interested in sorting out who is who in the world and how they got there, you also have to look at this, which is Abraham. He married Sarai. She gets her name changed to Sarah. He has Isaac. He has two children, but Isaac is the child of promise. The child that he has with Hagar, Ishmael, is not the child God promised to him. So it's this line from Abraham to Sarah, Isaac to Jacob that we are most concerned with, that God was actually trying to tell the story of this particular line. What cannot be ignored is that after Sarai dies, uh, actually before she dies, Hagar, as we know, is sent away with her child Ishmael. Uh, Sarai dies, and then Abraham will take another wife, Keturah, and produces other children. And there's this whole line from this particular branch that people just homogenize as the Arab people, and I told you that's a fallacy. Equally, those descending from Esau, which people automatically assume become Arabs, and that's equally a fallacy. Why is this important? Because in a future time, prophetically, we have abundant reference to the fact that people will come from lands that are usually synonymous with the Muslim faith, with Islam. They will come and they will worship at the mount. This is at a future time, and it's speaking of basically worshiping the one God, Jehovah, all right? So it's important to understand that there are people mixed into the woodpile that are not, they've been thrown into a category but actually they don't belong to that category. Now on that same note, I'd like to explain something else, which some people are not going to like, but tough. All right, the word Semite actually comes from the name Shem, and all the descendants of Shem, which by the way, would include those of uh, Arab descent, those of uh, anything that lends itself under this umbrella, it, is, it was not limited to, in its original use, it was not limited to, there was no such thing as Jew at the time. So when people refer to a Semite, I need to be clear on the original terminology of this word. A Semite is referring to a person who speaks what we call a trilateral consonant language, like we've seen in Hebrew, where you get three consonants put together to make a word, and you add the vowel points, Semitic languages, which include, by the way, I think this is important for people to understand, include things like Arabic, Phoenician, there's a whole umbrella, umbrella category that falls under this. Anti-Semitic was originally introduced sometime in the 1800s, and it was originally referring to people of Chaldean origin but it had no immediate implication as anti-Jewish. That term has later been taken up. And there was a big quarrel between the late 17, mid 1800s uh, for people actually trying to get the right nomenclature for this. So as anti-Jewish sentiments arose in different parts at different times, the idea was that it would be better to call a person who was anti-Jewish and label it in some form attached to anti-Judaism rather than anti-Semitic because they realized early on that this was an umbrella category for all people of Semitic tongues. By the way, that would also include Ethiopian. Go figure that one out, okay? So um, we need to not be ignorant when we use certain terms. So we know from my chart and from what I've just told you, that Abraham is referred to as a Hebrew, which doesn't mean Jew, Jewish, or Judaism, nor can he be called an Israelite. Please put that down somewhere. Israel is Abraham's grandson. We know that Jacob, Abraham's grandson, gets his name changed in Genesis 32, 28, after wrestling with the angel of the Lord. So let's take a look at this in process. Jacob basically runs away from home. He finds a long-lost uncle, Laban, works for him. And Laban was just as much a conniver as Jacob was. 
Laban has these two lovely daughters that are with him. Jacob sets his eyes on the beautiful daughter, Rachel. Oh, he wants her so badly. He wants to marry. And Laban says, OK, you can have her. And he says, but you got to work a set amount of time to get her. And he thinks that the wedding night is here and he's marrying Rachel, but he actually is married off to Leah, the ugly sister, and begins to produce children. And I've numbered the children here. You see one, two, three, four. Now, Leah has a handmaid named Zilpah. That means that Jacob, who is Israel, gets, uh, he's got basically four women that he produces children with. So Leah produces these children. These are the children of Israel here. Jacob basically has children with Zilpah, that is Leah's handmaid, and produces two children here. Then we've got Rachel, the one he wanted, who originally was barren and could not produce children. Then God opened up her womb, gave her two children, Joseph and Benjamin. And of course, he also uh, has children with Rachel's handmaid, Bilhah. So all of these children will be known as the children of Israel. So Jacob, who becomes Israel, these are his children that will be known as first the children of Israel. Then ultimately, these children will have children of their own to become the tribes of Israel that later will become the house of Israel. But let me be clear about this, because this is where people go downhill, and you're going to hear me repeat this through the message. House of Israel does not denote Judaism like ipso facto. It does not. I'm going to explain and separate the difference because it will become important to understand what we're looking at and globally why there are certain things that are in place and why there's even a reference in the book of Revelation to something that we should take note of. So all this matters. All right. For the record here, Joseph, as we know, will go, will be sold off by his loving brothers into bondage they basically tell Jacob, who is Israel, that his favorite son is basically dead. More or less, that's the, not the nubbin of the story. While, meanwhile, we know Joseph is in Egypt. He's in prison for a time. He's the only one that interprets the dreams of Pharaoh aright. The dreams meant seven years of plenty, seven years of famine. And basically, Joseph rises through the ranks. He's given a woman, an Egyptian woman, to marry and produces two children with her, Ephraim and Manasseh. Now, all of the children of Israel, all these brethren will be united with Joseph, not knowing that he's Joseph, that he's this most important man in the land of Egypt. They'll come because there's a famine. And basically, Joseph saves not only his brethren and all of the land, but he saves Egypt and pretty much the whole populace on the face of the earth at that time living in that area because of the interpretation of Pharaoh's dream. Now, just before Jacob, who is Israel, just before he dies, he blesses Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. There is no tribe of Joseph per se. I'm going put to put a little asterisk there because it pops up somewhere in the Bible in one place as tribe of Joseph, but there is no tribe of Joseph per se. So when we're talking about, people talk about the tribes of Israel, Joseph is basically taken out. Why? Because Ephraim and Manasseh, his Egyptian-born sons, will be grafted in. Jacob, who is Israel, adopts them. And then you've got one other group of people who basically are outside of the realm. They're included in the tribes, but they're not included in land distribution, and that would be the tribe of Levi. So. When we talk about Israel, it's very important. I'm talking about Bible now. Abraham's grandson, Jacob, who becomes Israel, the reference is Genesis 32, has all of these children. These children will bear more children, so the children of Israel become the house of Israel, eventually will become the kingdom of Israel. And when the kingdoms divide, I'll get to that in a minute, we'll, we will see that the northern kingdom will be called Israel. The southern kingdom will be by a different name. Now, of the sons of Israel, Jacob, Israel, of his sons, the fourth child born to Leah is Judah. Judah marries a Canaanite woman. There's already stuff going on in the woodpile, all right? Now, these people were told to not commingle for a purpose. 
But I believe God in his infinite wisdom knew some of the components to this. There's nothing when people say the pure race of these people. That's impossible. That's not possible. Okay. So we have here Judah, who will obviously become an important element all the way into the New Testament. Why? Because it's through the line of Judah that we get to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you read the genealogies that open up, especially Matthew's Gospel, and trace that, it will show you this is the line, the line of Judah from the house of Judah, which is why Jesus is called the line of the tribe of Judah in the book of Revelation. But the tribe of Judah itself becomes singularly, eventually, the focus of the latter part of the Bible, not Israel, not the northern tribes. Hold that thought. So Judah marries Shuna, Shua, a Canaanite woman. They have three children. The firstborn, Ur, marries Tamar, but the Bible says that Ur was wicked. He wouldn't uh, do his husbandly duties. And so God killed him. Next, <laughs> Onan, same thing. He would not take the responsibility that he was supposed to take based on the laws that were in force in those days. So he dies. He's killed as well. That leaves only Sheila. And as I told you last week here, Tamar cannot wait. She realizes that Sheila probably will not be given as a husband as he is younger. So she takes matters into her own hands. And I read to you the passage last week that basically describes her uh, taking off her garments that she was mourning for the loss of her husband, covered herself up, sat on the roadside. Basically, her father-in-law, Judah, impregnates her. That produces twins, Faraz and Zara, however you want to spell their names. And on the Faraz line, we will basically watch the line go down all the way to Christ. So all of these children of Israel, safe to say, can be called Hebrews. They can all be called Hebrews. They can all be called Apiri, Abiru, Ibiri, all of them, because this is where that name comes from. And as I've said, Abraham is referred to in Scripture as Hebrew. No problem with that. Here's where the problem begins. When we start to look at terminology, and what happens along the way is people tend to say the children of Israel, and immediately, because of ignorance, say these are all Jews, and they are not. This becomes relevant, by the way, if you're interested in biblical prophecy, if you're interested in unfolding the books of Ezekiel and the books of Daniel, the book of Revelation, you need to know and distinguish the difference between these people, otherwise nothing will make sense. So with that being said, go back to my notes here. So based on everything that we know, we know that all of these people that came to live under the prosperity of Joseph in Egypt, and they lived in that land called Goshen, which we know now, archaeologically speaking, as a virus. And they were called shepherd kings, sometimes being called Hyksos, and that these people became incredibly populous in the land. So much so, and it's very important that we kind of look at this carefully, we know that Joseph was in Egypt by about, from about the age of 30, and we know that he lived to 110. So it's safe to say that 80 years of Joseph's life was spent in Egypt. What is not abundantly clear, and there's a lot of discrepancy here on this, as to how long they were in Egypt in that land of prosperity before they entered into Egypt's bondage. This we don't know. According to ancient records from people like Manetho, it could be much more a much longer time. Some people have put it at 140 years. Some people have put it at 300 years based on numbers and names that have been uncovered and unearthed at Avaris. Uh, the archaeological finds of Petrie and others that basically chron chronicle this. All I'm concerned with saying is that in the biblical record, it says, then there rose up a pharaoh who knew not Joseph. That tells me one thing. There had to be a good amount of time elapse for a pharaoh to rise up to not know who Joseph was, if Joseph was the savior of the land in his day, second in command 
only after Pharaoh, as Pharaoh placed a ring on his finger, gave him chariot, gave him all the, the land he desired, had to be a good amount of time that elapsed. Now, we know that while they are in Egypt, they enter into Egypt's bondage, these children of Israel, all right? All the descendants, but not all. Here's the big problem, okay? We know from archaeological evidence that there were several exoduses before Moses' exodus out of the land of Egypt. And we'll talk about that in a minute because I touched on the descendants of uh, Judah, those twin Pharaohs and Zara. Zara is the one who would be ruling in Egypt before they went into bondage. And there's a reason for that too. If you remember, Reuben forfeited the chance as he was the firstborn. He forfeited the chance to rule based on him basically defiling, would be the concubine or the handmaid of his father, defiling the bed. So Reuben is out. It is Simeon and Levi who avenge the rape of Dinah. So they're ruled out. So the next one in line becomes Judah and his line to rule. That's how that happened. Now, as I said, they are prosperous. They end up going into Egypt. They're in bondage. That begins the record, the biblical record, of the book of Exodus. In that book, we are told about Moses. And here's some little important things we tend to just gloss over. We learn from reading a careful reading that Moses' family is from the tribe of Levi. They're Levites. That tribe will give way eventually to become the priesthood, the mouthpieces for God. That same family has Aaron and Miriam in it, and Aaron will become the head of the priesthood when God establishes it from the tribe of Levi. That brings up another situation. God basically eventually will give land to all of these children of Israel. Levi will not get land because of their role and position basically as the mouthpieces and workers for God. That's the first book of Scott. So what we have here is we know that they are referred to in the book of Exodus as Hebrews. And again, there is no mention of Jew or Judaism, Jewishness, if you will. You've got to go real far into the Bible to find that. In fact, the first reference to Jew truly as we understand it, is in 2 Kings and thereafter in Esther. And these books date to one about 500 B.C., the other one some mid-400s B.C. That tells you that the word itself, as we use it today, was not being used as we use it. Okay, It's been, forgive me for saying it this way, it's really been bastardized. So it's important. That's why we're so trying to sort this out and make sense of this. So... What we have here is Moses, through God, becomes the liberator of the children of Israel. And they come out of Egypt's bondage, and there is a time when judges basically are ruling the people. And then there is a prophet of God. That prophet is rejected, and so ultimately they get a monarchy. That monarchy st starts with Saul, who started out good but turned bad goes to David, and then to Solomon. So when, um, when the kingdom was united, this is the land as it looked like, as the united kingdom that was ruled by a singular king right up until the time that Solomon died. Now we know this. God made allotment for each of the tribes. Forgive me, these are my little scribblings. Your Bibles have these maps in them, so please use your Bibles. It's much better than this. But God assigns land to the 12 tribes. And you can see here, I've tried to color them a little bit, so you can see here's Simeon and here's Judah. Dan has a little portion right there. Benjamin, Ephraim, Manasseh, Gad. Okay, so you can see all of that. So very clearly, all of these things mattered. But at the death of Solomon, God basically said, for the sake of your father, David, I'm going to keep the kingdom intact. 
But because of Solomon's sin, what was Solomon's sin? Well, listen, he had over a thousand women to entertain between wives and concubines. And that wouldn't have been uncommon in that day for men to take multiple wives, except for the fact that he took for himself wives that were of extreme, uh, from distant lands that basically influenced. And it says that they turned his heart away from Jehovah. And basically, from serving one god, he went on to erecting altars and doing all kinds of things. You know, when you love people, you do stupid things, right? So he's told, King Solomon is told, only because your father was a, a man after my own heart, God speaking through a prophet, that I won't tear up the kingdoms. But at, when you die, they will be divided. And sure enough, forgive me again, this is a terrible way to show this, but when Solomon dies, which is about 950-something B.C., the kingdoms indeed do divide. This portion here represents Israel, the northern kingdom, and this rep represents Judah, the southern kingdom. And why is this important? Because when we start to talk about who is Israel, Israel will represent this northern kingdom. This Israel is not synonymous with Jewish, Judaism, it's not synonymous with any of that. Down here, the tribe of Judah is. Now let me do a little explaining. And as I said, for many of you, this is great review, but it was prophesied that the kingdom of the north, which is Israel, would basically be carried away by Assyrians and go into captivity. There is another prophecy that talks about the southern kingdom being carried away a little bit later into and by the Babylonians, into Babylonia. Now, here is what's important. The northern kingdom, Israel, goes into uh, Assyria's deportation. And the vast majority of Israel, the northern kingdom, never returns to Palestine. Put a period there. That should start sorting out a little bit. Northern kingdom, not Jews. You can say they were all children of Israel, yes. They could all be classified as Hebrews, yes, but not all Jews. They, northern kingdom, deported to Assyria, and they, there may be a scant trace, but this Bible does not record the northern people ever coming back. They simply are deported, and for all intents and purposes, if one wasn't digging, they just simply disappear off the pages of the Bible. And magically, if you're looking at history, they reappear as other people. And very interestingly enough, we can trace who they are, and we can trace where they went, each and every tribe that left, where they went, very, very clearly. Now, with the help of archaeological ar discoveries, uh, specifically, the study of skeletal remains found uh, predominantly around the area of Lake Van, the Caucasus, all of that whole area right there, we can definitively know who these first people moving through the lands were, and we can identify them pretty good. To the south, Judah. There was no term Jew yet. There were people of Judah, by the way, the tribe of Judah is lumped, if you saw, with the little tribe of Benjamin. There might have been a spattering of Levi in there. That's a question mark. Here's the thing. These people, the southern kingdom, Judah, get deported to Babylon, which was foretold by the prophets that it was going to happen. And then the heathen king Cyrus, under the petition, basically, of Nehemiah, says, let the people back so that they can rebuild the city, Jerusalem's walls, which were torn down. We know that we, we can know approximately how many people were carried away from Judah into Babylonian captivity, and we know the number that came back to rebuild, relatively small. That number of people pretty much is chronicled within the books of Nehemiah and Ezra. That kind of gives you an idea. And the Bible then will become concerned, the rest of the Bible, until the close of the Old Testament canon, will be concerned with the house of Judah, not so much as in 
its focus, but dealing with the people that came back. Now, you'll find references to Israel, and you'll find references to Ephraim, Samaria, all these terms, which I will cover and outline in great clarity in the coming messages. So don't think, oh, I, I missed it now. But what I want to make absolutely abundantly clear, we begin to see terminology evolve. So first, those who were of the tribe of Judah are known as Yehudahi. That becomes known as Judahite. Later, if you want the New Testament term for that, they're called Judeans. But actually, they are Jews. The word Jew itself is equally interesting. If you look, if you're interested, find an etym etym etymological source. There's a great one, uh, Etymology Online. Look it up. It'll tell you that the term really introduced into the English language. We're not talking about the word itself, but into the English language, again, maybe dates to about the 12th or 13th century, but did not come into full use. Wait for it. Although, if you look at the English version of Wycliffe's work, Jew appears a little bit different. It's spelt a little differently. It's there, but it was not a commonly known word. It becomes commonly introduced into our English frame after the production of the King James Bible. And I think at, there are places in this Bible where they actually had to go back and make some amendments based on the acceptance of certain terms that were then being used. That's something that there's not two, two scholars are not agreed on this, but what I can tell you is that the term Jew gets used very uh, ambiguously. But here's why I said to you, I was trying to show something at the beginning when I referred, for example, to people, the world's population of Jewish people, for example, in today's modern age, are either Ashkenazic or Sephardic. The Ashkenazi branch would be those that originally stemmed from, they were not Jewish at the first, they originally stemmed from the areas of Turkey and Armenia and other places, and it was their reigning royalty in the 8th century they were called the Khazars in the Khazar kingdom. Their royalty, the king and his court, took up Judaism in name only. And it's much later that these people begin to graft on and, and take the Jewish faith, but they are not born of the stock of Judah. They are not Semitic people. So when people talk about anti-Semitic, can you see now how words and definitions, when you go back far enough, it matters? People are saying anti-Semitic anti behavior towards this group of people who are not even Semites. Does that make sense to you? <laughs> now, I'm not an anti-Semite in the modern use of the term, uh, but I, I'm just blown away by the amount of ignorance that we see. Now, by the time that Rome is ruling, that basically Palestine comes under Roman rule, we will have a clear concept of who's living there. The people from the tribe of Benjamin who return, because they're, with, they're clumped into that category of Judah, they return and they settle around Galilee and they become Galileans. There's a whole migration of people throughout the course of history. So it's important for us to get these terms right. So let me say it this way, every Jew is an Israelite. What's an Israelite? A ch child descending from the children of Israel, Jacob Israel, right? Every Jew is an Israelite, but every Israelite is not a Jew. I hope that's clear. Okay. So, um, here's the thing. When you read the prophecies that are aimed at the Jewish people in this book, they were to be a scattered people, persecuted Listen very carefully. Without nationality, a proverb, few in number, they were to reject Christ. And as for Israel, northern kingdom, given all of this, we have a, an interesting amount of prophecy for them. They were to be lost for a time, come to light in the latter day referred to as the house of Israel. Listen very carefully. The house of Israel 
are called God's chosen people. This is, these are things that are always mixed up. It's always saying, oh, the Jews are the chosen people. House of Israel. Did I say House of Israel are Jews? No. Were we clear on that? Because I'm going to keep repeating this until you go, yeah, I got it. Okay? They are called inheritance of God. They were to be, this is in the Bible, they were to be divorced from the Mosaic law. They were to lose their name, their language. They were to possess the isles of the seacoast. They are to be great and successful colonizers, a company of nations to have a monarchy, to have David's seed and throne ruling over them. They are to possess Palestine and invite their brethren, Judah, back in. Future time hasn't happened yet. So if you don't know the difference between Judah, southern kingdom and those people, and the northern kingdom, and I've been talking all this time about the two branches being put together again. Now maybe that makes sense. That's for a future time, has not happened yet. Now, I, I, now I'm actually caught up to my notes here. Samite is a noun that seems to appear around 1840s, a Jew, Arab, Assyrian, or Aramean. Now, let me go back a little bit to the reference of these children, the descendants of Judah, and specifically the Zara branch that we were looking at. If you remember, I said to you that we have a clear picture of several migrations that happened before the Exodus. And I can kind of paint a little bit of a picture here. It's becoming more and more clear. I have a tremendous amount of books on this subject, and I can tell you almost every single author has done the same thing to homogenize uh, a group of people who left before the Exodus under the Zara branch and have homogenized it with a group that appears a little bit later, not too much later, from the tribe of Dan. Let me go back just one second here to my list. Remember I told you that the table of nations helps us to understand certain things. So, remember last week I said to you, it is a descendant of Zara that ends up basically sailing off Darda or Dara, Darda, Dardanus, sails off and settles a Grecian area, an isle that we're going to say be somewhere between what is now Cyprus and Crete and begins basically to settle in there. Why that's important to, to note is that this person wasn't the first person there. There were actually, we'll call them proto-Grecians that were there before. These people that would have been there before are in the line of Japheth, okay? So in this line here, if you take a look, you've got the line of Javan. And this line here, forgive me, I know it's very hard to read, but the line of Javan, which produces these descendants, which all look like Hebrew names, Elisha. But Elisha, you'll find two Greek cities named after Elisha, Elis and Elysis. Kittim, which is ancient Cyprus. But here's the name I want you to look at, Dodanim, the people of Dodan. So you're going to find that if you're looking for early civilizations, but after this. So imagine what I'm going to tell you. Seems a little convoluted. Bear with me. There were people living in those parts that are, we'll call them, this term does not exist. I'm just making it up right now for the ease of the mind. They were proto-Grecians in type. They were actually Greeks, but proto-Grecians, in fact, to say that they were before and before a term is actually established. Then we have this wave of people that come out of Egypt before the children of Israel go into Egypt's bondage. They begin to settle there. And I think there is a collision of the names Dodanim, Doda, which also has a um, relevant, all the names of of the tribes of Dan eventually. So I said, there's, I believe there's a conflation of sorts going on, so it's not really clear for a lot of scholars. But what I can tell you is that these people basically settled there, and we have enough information to start understanding that these people who belong to the tribe of Judah, remember, what did I tell you about the tribe of Judah? These people would be known as Jews eventually, right? They weren't yet, but they would have been known as such. These people 
a sliver of them move out along the coastline and they start basically, we have a history, the history of Crete and the history of Troy, which trace back to two or three particular names which we can trace back to the Bible. Chalcol or Calcol, which is a descendant of Zara. Um, the uh, Zara branch, as I said, has this Darda or Dardanus. And a third person is mentioned, which I can't exactly say where he fits in, but he fits into this branch somewhere called Cadmus. And why I say I can't figure it out is because there's actually two or three people bearing that name. But what I do know is this. If you want to have more confusion, master of confusion, right? If you want to have more confusion, where do you think our alphabet came from? Most people believe that our alphabet uh, developed and we're from a particular stream. Take a real good look at this, and sorry, it may be hard to read because I didn't do this for you, but if you start with Sumerian and Akkadian cuneiform, move down to Egyptian hieroglyphs, you've got Proto-Sinaitic, Proto-Phoenician, Proto-Canaanite, Proto-Hebraic, Ugaritic that stems that way to cuneiform or cuneiform, but Phoenician starts there, and we know that the Phoenician alphabet is brought to Greece. How do we know that? Well, history records it. But then you've got this little book here, Mysteries of the Alphabet, Mark Allen, I hope I say this right, Ukunin. Um, and somebody will be kind enough probably to put this somewhere where we can know who published it. Abbeville Press Publishers, I always give credit when I read from things, uh, 1999 copyright, but in the section that talks about proof of a line of descent, the Greek alphabet, which subsequently gave rise to the Latin alphabet, is directly derived from the proto sinaitic alphabet via Phoenician and ancient Hebrew. The oldest trace of the Greek alphabet dates from the 8th century BC. Four basic points indicate this, and they go on, but the first one this is according to Greek tradition, the letters of the alphabet are called Phoenicia Grammata, meaning Phoenician letters, or Cadmia Grammata, the letters of Cadmos. So we have, there's, what I'm telling you, everything that I'm telling you is not like some weird thing and be, oh, that's a, you know, you're, you're kind of a delusional speaker here. We can back all this up. So what becomes apparent is while we have an exodus before the exodus, we have a collision of civilizations coming together, being exposed to some of the most radical wisdom that eventually will be attributed to other people, so unfortunate. So let me give you an idea. And by the way, these people who migrate, the first wave of people who migrate under the Zara, they don't forget who they are uh, until much later, about 1100, when Brutus founds New Troy, which becomes New London, which becomes England, uh, and deposits the name there. His name, by the way, Brutus, comes from a derivative of the Bara Barit name, which is covenant. But they will basically forget who they are. They already did that when they were in captivity. They, that was pretty much taken care of while they were in captivity, but that's a story for another day. So what you have is early civilizations kind of coming in contact with each other. The early Minoans, an extremely advanced civilization. This is what's mind-boggling, and I, I can't explain this to you. No one can explain it to you how this is, but it appears as though Darda or the descendants of Darda or Dardanus, worked side by side with the Minoans, became a strong force. And there is reason to believe that the Minoan people are but a branch off of the Darda people. And there's good reason to believe that, which, again, I won't get into today, but there's a lot to back this up. This kingdom and these people basically come to an end with the volcanic eruption of Mount Theros, which that's that. And then we have good reason to believe that a group of those people take off and go to another island, 
And now we have, definitely, we have proof that Minoans have mixed with the line of uh, the Zara branch, have produced children, and, and a whole other civilization will pop up. Kind of interesting. Um, according to the book Troy and the Trojan War by Manfred Korfman, Greek colonists settled Troy, making the Achaeans and the Trojans brethren. So we've got a whole bunch of people who will start to commingle. Then you've got another exodus that occurs. And this one, I'm going to tell you speculation. I speculate that the tribe of Dan, part of the children of Israel, also had a, an exodus about the same time as the Zara branch leaves before the exodus of Moses. I believe that there was a faction of those people that left. And then there's another exodus on their part, which seems to be tied into Judges 5. While the people are being attacked, a lament is said, why does Dan stay in his ships? And it gives you a good clue. If you take a look again at this map of where their territory would be, they are coastal people. So it's not a far stretch. By the way, Asher has the same problem. They're going to become coastal people, too, and drift seaward. Uh, if you're a history person, you have read about these various invasions by sea people. We'll talk about that, too, in the coming messages. But what I want to go back to that I just mentioned is Dan. So Dan will be another group that we will encounter. And they will start, basically, like all of these people will, put their name somewhere. And we see that with Dan. If you turn with me to the book of Joshua, you'll see it there as a beginning of a type of things that they do. So beginning in Joshua 19th chapter, you have the portion of Dan's land. Now that tells you something. That tells you that they all didn't go away uh, during that first exodus that I'm alluding to. And there's such good records kept that we know approximately how many people were in the tribe of Dan when they set up their camp. The Book of Numbers will chronicle it. And then, ultimately, if you start reading, we will find that the book of, uh, in the Book of, I believe, Chronicles, Dan disappears. There's no counting. There's no reckoning. So it's kind of interesting. That is a little clue to tell you that these people basically will have taken off eventually. But in Dan's portion, beginning at verse 40, the seventh lot came out of the tribe of the children of Dan, according to their families. And it goes on to talk about the different people referenced and the borders thereof. And the coast of the children of Dan went out too little for them. Therefore, the children of Dan went up to fight against Lishim, took it, smote it with the edge of the sword, possessed it, dwelt therein, called Lishem, Dan, after the name of their father, Dan. So they had a tendency to do this. They have another place that they named, called it the Camp of Dan. That was very uh, synonymous with these peoples. They would go and they would find places and they would put their name to it or their father's name to it or their tribe name to it. Um, now, from, I have it here, from 1 Chronicles 2 forward, Dan basically disappears. And we know that 1 Chronicles would be probably most likely written after the captivity, which would explain why they weren't there. Dan, as well as Zebulun and Asher, these tribes located on the coast won't be mentioned either. If you look for them in the later records, they're not there. We know from Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, when the final land division is supposed to occur, which again, future time, not yet occurred, Dan is given land, but Dan is missing in the sealing of the 12,000 from each tribe in the book of Revelation. Maybe we'll talk about that because I think I have some insight to that. But there are internal proofs in this book. If you want to know about how to look for things and see things aright. In Ezekiel 27, there is a strange mention. And I want you to look carefully at this. 
In Ezekiel 27, in verses 19, 17 through 19, Judah and the land of Israel. It doesn't say Judah and the people. It says Judah and the land of Israel. They were thy merchants. They traded in thy market wheat of Minnith and Penag and honey, oil and balm. And then read on in verse 19, Dan also and Javan going to and fro occupied in thy fairs. Dan, the tribe of Dan, Javan, Greeks. And we know that biblical, the biblical interpretation of Javan, especially from the prophets, is made abundantly clear, especially when you're reading the book of Daniel, which spe speaks of this king coming, coming out of this country, which is none other than Alexander the Great. We have a clear, distinct reference of who Javan is. So don't you find it interesting, nestled right here in Ezekiel, Dan and Javan are put there. And I've told you, no, no coincidence that these people from the tribe of Dan will basically breadcrumb over what was already settled at one point by the Zara branch, going out towards the Isles, towards Greece, and Turkey, Greece, and onward. So it's kind of interesting. You've got a lot of these internal references that you have to look for. Uh, three places, as I said, in Dan references to Javan, another place in Zechariah. So we have a clear understanding of who Javan is. But then we also have Dan inhabiting basically the territory of Greece and trading with Tyre. This opens up another thing. It appears as though the Danites, the tribe of Dan, intermarried with the people of Tyre, which helps us to understand what is said in 2 Chronicles 2.14. The son of a woman of the daughters of Dan, and his father was a man of Tyre, skillful to work in gold and silver and brass, iron, stone, timber, purple, blue, and fine linen, crimson, also to grave any manner of graving, and to find out every device which shall be put to him with thy cunning men, and the cunning men of my Lord David thy father. So here's what we know we're talking about. Who is called Hurim in verse 12 is actually Hiram of Tyre. So you can see that there's this convergence right there. And the mention of the woman, the son of a woman of the daughters of Dan, and his father was a man of Tyre. So you can already see right there, there's a biblical reference to these people commingling already. And it's right there. I don't have to make it up. It's right there. And if we begin tracing just Dan, we have places like Chaldeon, both a river of Attica, an ancient uh, Aetolian town in Greece, Macedonia, the Danube, Danastris, which is the, D the Dniester, the Danapris, uh, Don. We'll see more of that as we move towards Spain, that even the word there, Don, is from Dan. Uh, equally, Rodan. So we've got a whole bunch of these uh, that will be implemented. Denmark, Demoria, um, it, it's endless. The whole of the, the people, the Danoian people, if you want, now founding a place called Devonshire, the north of Ireland, and an ancient place called Scotia, of course, which becomes known by a different name later, attached to another group of people that eventually we will recognize have merged with the tribe of Dan, but their footprints go clear to a place called the Tuatha de Danon, which is the, basically the people or the tribe of Dan, the Dundee, Aberdeen, the River Don, and eventually develops into terminology like the Shar Dana, which will, Shar meaning chief, prince, or ruler, where we will ultimately get words like Tsar, Kaiser, and so forth that will develop. Now, all of this is just a bunch of gobbledygook and a bunch of info if you can't start honing it down a bit and realize something. What I've just done here is put out what is maybe just a, a handprint, an outline. The thing I want you to walk away with today very clearly, north and south, the south people, Judah, which also had the tribe of Benjamin in it, they return back to Palestine. They returned to build the walls of the city. Ezra and Nehemiah chronicle that. The northern kingdom, Israel, if there's a scant 
a group of them, we don't have a record really. They do not return to the land of Palestine and they basically disappear. So when people talk about biblical Israel, we're talking about first the man, Jacob, who becomes Israel, then his children, children of Israel, then the house of Israel, then when the kingdoms divide, the kingdom of Israel. And that sometimes is recorded in the Bible equally known as something like Samaria. The people to the south will become synonymous and equal to and attached to Jews and Jerusalem. So when we tackle this again next week, hopefully this will already have taken root and will have start to alleviate some of the, what I call, conflagration of terms, which if you're going to study this book, you need, as I say, to be very clear. Why? Because prophecy, a lot of prophecy is aimed You'll read, oh, house of Israel, or oh, Ephraim, from the prophets. How can you understand who it's referring to if you erroneously think that the house of Israel is a synonym for Jews of this day, which it is not? Now, hear me out when I tell this. This is the last part of this. I do not believe, I for many years believed that in the book of Revelation when it says these that are sealed, the 144 preachers of righteousness, I actually don't believe that God is going to pull from every corner of the earth these 144,000. What I really believe is that these people, if you read the book of Revelation, there's already been some type of a resurrection. There's already been stuff happening that could, you'd say, how is this possible? So what I'm about to say would not make it impossible. Remember the vision that John saw? He saw the 24 elders around the throne saying, holy, holy, holy. He saw a whole bunch of things that point to a future time. So how would it be hard to believe that the people that appear in the book of Revelation have been sealed by God in the past and they are none but resurrected saints from days of old that will be resurrected at the end to do the preaching that we in this day and age won't be able to do, not only because we may not be here, but because we ourselves have diluted, have watered down, have homogenized, even the best of the best won't even come close to those who would have had first-hand knowledge of what it meant to serve the living God in purity. And I'm not talking about purity as in I wash my hands, but pure, pureness of heart. Only those who were previously sealed, who I believe these will be resurrected saints to preach to a mass multitude. And think of it this way. What would be better to have 144,000 preachers of righteousness that, are, that just appear and are pulled from four corners of the earth? Or 144,000 of these who are resurrected, who came back from the dead, who are telling you, hey, last call. <laughs> I think that might change the tone of things just a little bit. If you're interested in anything else about this subject, come back next week. We'll pick up then. That's my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.